Okay, good afternoon, guys. I'm going now to give you some comments on your translations. And uh, what I'm going to comment on today are uh, translations of the snow and cemetery path and what else, popular mechanics and another one, um, the dinner party and last one on discovery. So uh, these are what I will comment on. And uh, actually I have given you individual comments which I have sent to your, um, to your um, MS Teams. But I commented only from one person for each group, okay? Not both. So if you don't get the comments in your own uh, submission, you might want to check with your partner. Uh, you will get the answer uh, or the comments there in your partner's submission. And now what I'm going to show you is my comments on, uh, my general comments on the potential difficulties of the translation, as well as on some, uh, what some important things like the accuracy and uh, also the conciseness and adaptation. All right, now let me show you this notes that I took for you. All right, these are what I found for you. First of all, I would like to comment on the potential challenges. The first one is uh, popular, popular mechanics. The potential challenge lies in the use of she and he and her and him, which happens all the time. What I would suggest for you to do is to either change she and he to pria itu and perempuan itu or pria dan wanita or laki-laki perempuan or you can even use husband and wife. One of you unconventionally or uh, quite unusually uses um, Arjuna and Devi. It's funny. Uh, you might want to check with the translator. Uh, there. And the second thing is about the title. The title is quite tricky because popular mechanics, uh, some people say it's taken from the title of a uh, men's magazine. Or it can also mean the general turn of things. If a fight like this happens, this is what commonly uh, happens. That's why uh, the characters here are not named because um, supposedly it is a common thing when a fight between a man and a, and a woman takes place in this context. And the second thing for potential uh, for snow, the poten potential challenges are in the, strange, the sense of strangeness. That's the first one. And the second one is related to the social context, which is uh, New York, immigrant life and uh, Catholic community. And when we talk about immigrants from uh, Latin America in the United States, we usually talk about the Catholic groups because, uh, because the, the non-immigrants Americans are mostly Christian and not Catholic. All right, and the last one is related to the the terms related to war, terms like nuclear, missile, and um, what else, trained. These are complex um, words, specialized words that might pose potential challenges for you. And the second, the third short story is the dinner party. The language is quite rich in, in language and tone and uh, it uses terms that are not really common anymore, although the short story is not really old. It's mostly because the setting of the story is a colonial India. So uh, you might need to be aware of terms used in colonial India, terms such as uh, government attache or uh, the use of uh, expressions like idioms, such as the jumping at the side of a mouse, things like that might pose potential challenge. And the next one will be, is related to the short story Cemetery Path, which is, a, which is in Russia, uh, especially the border towns of Russia, between Russia and the, the Cossack places. And because of that, 
the problems might lie in the historical references because it took place um, somewhere before the, the, the revolution of 1918, right? It's set before that time when, when there were still Cossacks uh, guarding the border towns of Russia. The cultural references are also common. And uh, here we might refer to the word of uh, the use of uh, taverns, for example, which are, uh, which nowadays we might call cafes or bars, but uh, in this place, in this rural area, it's called tavern for some reason. And Ivan the Terrible, the name Ivan the Terrible is also uh, unusual because it's not part of our history. And I know that in Indonesia, we have a term for this name. Some people use Ivan Yang Mengerikan, but uh, it might pose a potential challenge if you're not aware of uh, such a translation in Indonesia. And Cossack, Cossack is uh, the people who lives in this, who live in this border towns of Russia protecting Russia from uh, neighboring uh, countries. And the last one is on discovery, which is very unusual. Uh, the most important or the most typical challenge lies in its tongue in cheek tone. It sounds like serious, but there's humor in it, sometimes dark, and that might pose a challenge. And also the, the tone of the narrator is Tell tale like it, it's like tale like like telling a tale, you know. So, if you don't give the same tone as what the narrator here uses, it might not uh, give the same impact on the reader. So these are the challenges of these works. And when we translate, after knowing these challenges, we need to be aware of uh, this and try to emulate the, the original uh, tone of the story, the, try to take care of the difficult words so that when we come across a word that we're not familiar with, we don't just guess, but go to the dictionary to find out what it actually means. All right, now let us go to a few examples for conciseness and edit first and later on there will be an example for accuracy okay now for conciseness and adaptation I took this from one of you who translated suatu pagi saat aku duduk di mejaku aku melamun sambil menatap keluar jendela sambil melamun keluar jendela aku kemudian melihat titik-titik di udara seperti yang digambarkan sister Zoe and so on and so forth so uh, this translation can be in my opinion, uh, made more concise. And how do we make it? Uh, first of all, we need to check uh, the original structure of the text. And the second one will be to reduce the use of aku like this, because it's just a sub clause. Then uh, you can fuse aku and use the aku of the main clause. Like this one, suatu pagi aku duduk di majaku, aku melamun sambil menatap keluar jendela, sambil melamun keluar jendela. I think uh, this, this translator uh, needs to reduce, and I mean, needs to erase one of the part. Okay, let me change this. Aku melamun sambil menatap keluar jendela, sambil menatap. Okay, here, I guess. Sambil menatap keluar jendela, aku melihat udara, and so on. Gambarkan Suster Zoe, bentuknya secara tidak beraturan pada awalnya, kemudian menjadi banyak. Now, if you look at the structure of the original sentence, you will be able to come up with a more concise translation, which might look like this one. Suatu pagi, saat duduk di kelas, okay, instead of using Saat duduk di mejaku, you can use in Indonesian. It's more common to say saat duduk di bangku kelasku, or you can simply use saat duduk di dalam kelas sambil melamun melihat keluar kelas. Look out the window. It, we don't usually say 
melihat keluar jendela, but uh, melihat keluar is fine. Aku melihat titik di udara. I saw uh, the dots, white dots seperti yang digambarkan Suster Zoe. Awalnya jarang tak beraturan, tapi kemudian kian banyak. That would be all, and it should be enough, and it gives the impression of being in the classroom, looking outside at the window, looking out the window, and seeing these uh, white dots. So this is one way to make it more uh, concise. You don't actually lose any uh, any element of the story, but you adapt it to make it sound more natural. And uh, about another part that talks about conciseness is this. Um, I mentioned to you that we, when we talk, we often not use uh, imbuhan and akhiran, prefix and suffix. Like instead of saying menginginkan bayi ini, we usually say aku ingin bayi ini. And since it's literary work, which uh, wants to imitate the voice of anyone speaking in the real world, so you can use instead of aku menginginkan bayi ini, you can say tapi aku ingin bayi ini. Aku akan minta seseorang untuk datang mengambil barang-barangnya. That sounds very accurate, but it can be made more concise by saying Aku akan minta orang untuk mengambil barang-barangnya. Without datang should be fine. So what you will get is this. Tidak, tapi aku ingin bayi ini. Aku akan minta orang mengambil barang-barangnya. That would be enough to make it more concise and uh, more natural actually, more natural sounding. And last but not least, it's about accuracy. For accuracy, uh, the short story Snow offers quite a lot of things that we can discuss actually, but I'll just take a few here. Russian missiles were being assembled. So in Cuba, Russian missiles were being assembled. So the missiles are being assembled in Cuba. Why? Because Cuba is the ally of Russia, trained supposedly on New York City. Trained here doesn't mean being dilatih, yeah? but trained, another meaning of trained is directed at or pointed at New York City. So that's what it actually means. Uh, so when you say it's uh, dilatih menuju New York City, then uh, it is not, it's not uh, very accurate. So we, we, need to, uh, we need to tweak it to make it accurate. And the next one is from Popular Mechanics. Early that day, the weather turned and the snow was melting into dirty water. Early that day is uh, pagi itu, the weather turned. Turned here means uh, berubah, cuaca berubah, atau uh, you can use cuaca menjadi hangat. And the snow was melting into dirty water. Dan uh, salju yang di atas atap gedung meleleh menjadi air yang kotor. So that's what it actually uh, wants to tell us. And next, another example, last one, is from Snow. I like them a lot, especially my grandmotherly fourth grade teacher, Sister Zui. This is uh, the most misunderstood sentence in uh, the entire short story. Why? Because uh, there is this my, grandmotherly fourth grade teacher. Some people misunderstood this as meaning nenekku, guru pengajar kelas empat. Well, what it actually means is my fourth grade teacher who is grandmotherly, who acts like a grandmother. Or one of you used the word penyayang. Or you can also use uh, guru kelas empatku yang menyayangiku seperti seorang nenek, yang sikapnya seperti nenek. Because if you use kenenek-nenekan, it doesn't sound good at all, right? I know it is very accurate, but it doesn't sound good. So instead, you can use um, penyayang, yang sikapnya begitu menyayangi, or penuh kasih, and so on. You can use that. So that's all I have to say about your work. 
I would like to thank you so much for making the attempt to translate and eventually edit. I think uh, you are good teams here. And I hope the next translation project will give the other person in the group the opportunity to uh, edit a translation by uh, somebody, okay? So you will experience what it feels like, how liberating it is to, to edit. Because when you edit, maybe you are not worried too much about the, the original. You want to uh, worry more about the translation. However, however, I would say you might also need the burden of being a, an editor because uh, you are responsible for the, the final quality of the work. And that's why some people will also feel burdened by uh, burdened by the task of being a translator or an editor, okay? Well, I guess uh, that's all everyone. Uh, thank you very much for uh, listening to me. And I hope the next project will be more fun for you and will give you uh, the opportunity to be an editor and translator. I guess that's all, bye.